I like it. It's good. Some of you can sit outside if you'd like. <laughs> nice out. Nice out. Exactly. Do we want it on this setting? Should it get the room also? I'll leave this to you. I'll let you work it out however, however you think is best. <clears throat> or whatever you think is best. Good evening, my friends. Today is very exciting. I'm not looking at emails or something. I'm looking at the book, the Peace Pilgrim book. Uh, and Peace Pilgrim is the teacher who we will be discussing uh, for the next year or so. And she was one of the most important influences for me uh, in terms of my path, especially at the beginning, and then recently even more so. Sorry, I'm looking down at this. I'm trying to get to the correct location, even though I've more or less memorized this book and probably don't need it. But that's now it's there. Uh, unlikely I'll open that. <laughs> Worth having there. So she, uh, she had a great influence on me because she, as they say, walked her talk. Yes, uh, she, she actually walked her talk. She was not a hypocrite. And if you can find a spiritual teacher who's not a hypocrite, you should dedicate your entire life to them. Uh, there aren't that many, sorry to say. And those spiritual teachers who are hypocrites, it doesn't mean that they're bad people. It doesn't mean that they're bad. It doesn't mean that we have to be angry with them, look down on them, and such. Uh, it simply means that you shouldn't dedicate your life to them. You can learn from them, of course. You can appreciate them. But it's an entirely different thing to dedicate your life to what they teach. If they haven't, then follow their example. <laughs> If they're not even dedicating their life to their teaching, then trust them on that. <laughs> and, it's, and to be hypocrite means simply that you haven't dedicated your life to what you say. But she, as far as I can tell, did in a way that's very inspiring to me. And I think uh, she gives us an example of what is possible here. I think that she took the first steps in uh, showing us what deep spirituality looks like in our culture. And uh, provides us therefore with a direction. And more and more, I find myself utilizing her views, her teachings, uh, in the way that what we do here is done. Andrea, could you sit over one more? Yes, thank you. Uh, before I begin, just for my information, no pressure, no judgment, just for my information, how many people got her book and looked through it at all, in particular the sections that I Okay, great. So that's just what I needed to know. In that case, I'll tell you who Peace Program was. Uh, Peace Program was born in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, grew up like most of us. Uh, although in a somewhat poor family, with she got little education. 
Uh, but when I say, like most of us, I'm not referring to that. I'm referring to the fundamental worldview that she took on. That worldview was uh, making money is hard, but if you can make a lot of it, you'll be happy. And that was the teaching. And she took it for granted. I mean, she was just a kid, like most of us, very reasonably. We accept what we're told. What what else could we know? Um, it's a, that's okay. It's, it's no problem. Uh, we don't we don't know. We're just a kid. We just accept it. And uh, then she got a little older, and she was a teenager in her twenties, and she realized that not one but both of those things are untrue. It's not hard to make money. It's easy to make money. She never knew that. It's much harder to get along with one of your friends than to make plenty of money. Amazing. She had no idea that that was the case. She found that she could get a job anywhere, just try and keep the job. And it could be a very low paying job and it was plenty of money, plenty of money. Uh, <clears throat> So that was shocking to her. But furthermore, she discovered that the people she knew who had a lot of money typically weren't happy. And actually, she discovered that most people just aren't really that happy. Uh, people are very good at smiling and even laughing and uh, saying fine when you ask them how they are. But real happiness, she discovered, is quite rare. And so she considered that. What's happening here? And then as she grew older and older, things changed in the world. Things changed dramatically. And I think that one of the changes that happened in her lifetime is uh, is, should be as significant to all of us as it was to her. And that change was that human beings discovered how to uh, develop and use nuclear weapons. Human beings brought ourselves into a position in which a very few people were trained how to destroy our civilization and in fact, life as we know it in a matter of days due to passing political preferences. We literally put certain opinions about how a government should be run above life on earth, billions of people's lives, and not just human lives, trillions of lives. We put that life below attachment to certain political perspectives. And this, uh, the horror that she saw as the the, the great wars, what we call World War I and World War II, as those wars proceeded, the horror of that event uh, drove her to a point of desperation that very few of us have the confidence ever to feel. Few of us have the courage to feel that level of horror and fear that she wouldn't be able to do anything about it. 
she was trying to do things. She was trying this and trying that. He was trying to be a good lobbyist, trying to be a good fundraiser. She was trying things to, to bring about peace on earth. She was actually involved in a Quaker group. Uh, we're sitting here in a friends meeting house. She was involved uh, with the Society of Friends. She was trying a lot of different things to make the world a better place. And uh, it wasn't enough. She knew that she wasn't fulfilling her vow, but she wanted to, but she wasn't, but she wanted to, but she wasn't, but she wanted to, but she wasn't. And that brought her to a point, maybe even for just all of us, that might be helpful, sorry. Sorry. Uh, that brought her to a point of desperate uh, searching. And she found that uh, she could walk. She could walk in nature. And that that walking helped her to become more clear. And when she was more clear, she could see things a little bit more accurately. And one night, uh, as she walked, she entered a point of desperation that she hadn't encountered before. And it's important to make a certain point here about this word I'm using, desperation. Uh, Desperation, the, the, the amount of desperation that we, in the way that I'm using the term, which is actually a healthy experience, the way I'm using the term, this desperation that's healthy, depends primarily on our degree of self-confidence. To the extent that we're self-confident, we can uh, be horrified at the fact that we're not living up to our potential. And as we work through this book, please attend to this theme. She had worked very hard, even from when she was a teenager, at learning how to be a better person, at discovering her mistakes and then making changes. She, of course, was something of a spiritual genius. She says she's not, but mm, a certain amount of evidence would disagree with that claim. Uh, she said, it's, it's, I'm not a spiritual genius. Just, you just do the simple things. It's not hard. You just see that you're doing something that you're not proud of, and then you stop doing it. Hmm. That's what you do. It's not difficult. You just see, I shouldn't do it, and then you don't do it ever again. Okay, good. That actually indicates a certain amount of spiritual genius, <laughs> if you can actually do that. <laughs> and she could do it. Uh, she had difficulties with high school classmates, difficulties with coworkers later when she had a job. And she learned from each one and then made the change and discovered how to be friends with those people. Uh, she still had a great deal of problem. Uh, of, of, uh, uh, she had many issues. The main one was a sense of superiority. She uh, she felt that she was she just couldn't help it. She knew she shouldn't. This one was hard. She, it was hard for her to get over this one. Uh, but she had the sense that she's better than everyone else, and it's it's hard because in a certain way she was. Uh, and yet that perception, I'm better than everyone else, uh, was, uh, was a great hindrance in her life and in her wisdom and in her love. Yet she was able to move through a lot of other hindrances. And as she moved through those hindrances, she gained self-confidence. This point, 
so many of us want self-confidence and we have lots of methods of getting it and some of them are fine like tell yourself good things a lot that works well to a point but the doing is far more powerful we see what we do we see what we do that we're ashamed of we see what we do that we're ashamed of and we commit to making a change and then when we make the change in our behavior that cuts down deep into our self-image and gives us a kind of confidence that enables us to experience even deeper shame and desperation. Yes? Okay. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and it's essential that as we go through this, that we see that, uh, that there's a joy in that. And that a lot of the reason that we think that there isn't, a lot of the reason we think that that's not a fun adventure that's exciting and magnificent, is I believe that we've been trained not to. Because if you feel desperate in this way, well, I'll just lay this out for you, okay? And you see, you just see where this goes in your own mind. <laughs> if you feel desperate in that way, then it's very likely that you'll become depressed. You'll experience anxiety and depression. If you experience anxiety and depression in a skillful way, then you'll experience the ability to muster a Herculean determination, as Shenzhen says. It's great energy, a huge energy. If you bring forth that huge energy, then you'll experience a kind of joy that isn't dependent on sensory pleasures. If you experience a kind of joy that isn't dependent on sensory pleasures, then you can become free from clinging to perception itself. If you become free from clinging to perception itself, then you can see things as they truly are. And if you see things as they truly are, then you will directly see your place in saving, healing, serving the world. And you'll have a level of confidence that will make it impossible for anyone to stop you from doing it. Your ability to do that will be in no way dependent on anyone else. No one can stop you. If, now we're gonna keep going, if you reach that level of joy and freedom, yes, you're a terrible threat. You're a terrible threat. You'll do what Peace Program did and you'll change the culture. You'll say simple sentences and thousands of people's lives will change simply because you're living them. That's, uh, that's literally worse for our economy than terrorism. And you know what we do to terrorists. If you do that to our economy, if you undermine our economy in that way, then you're undermining capitalism. If you undermine capitalism, you're undermining the military, the US military, the largest organization that's ever existed. More employees than any other, more people depend on that for their livelihood than any other organization. Yes? And if you undermine the military, well then, you need to go, don't you? But the military doesn't have a way to get rid of you. They can't attack the weapons that you have. And so the structure of our culture, since there's nothing you can do once Peace Pilgrim becomes Peace Pilgrim, it's too late then. She got out of the cage. Once she's out of the cage, it's very difficult to deal with people like that. 
So the structure is to prevent people from becoming like that. So let's go back to the beginning. Remember those words I said? Desperation, depression, anxiety. It's essential to tell people that you must never experience those things. If you experience those things, you're sick. There's no skillful way to deal with it. You'll just get stuck there. And that's the end. There's no way out, you see. The best thing to do is to just put up with, try to accumulate more. Uh, relatively unsatisfactory sensory pleasures. Watch a little more TV. Be mindful as you drink your coffee. Enjoy the coffee more. And you're doing fine. It's okay. Soon enough, you'll just die. And in the meantime, your work. And you won't have any of these troublesome psychological illnesses that prevent you from working. She was willing to become desperate and she had the spiritual genius to know how to deal with that desperation, that depression, that anxiety in a skillful way. The issue is that we don't know how to deal with those things in a skillful way. Uh, I, uh, I often look at the definitions of these diseases, as you say, and they are, of course, very debilitating if you don't have the skills to know how to make use of them to attain enlightenment. Uh, and they're hard skills to develop. Don't get me wrong. You ask the residents here what it's like. Okay, you want to develop those skills, you're going to have to commit to that. I'm not saying good news, it's easy. I'm not saying that at all. If you think I'm saying that, visit. <laughs> I'm visit for a week, see if it's easy. I'm not saying it's easy. It's extremely difficult. You have to lose everything. You have to be willing to give up everything. But there are ways of doing that so that there's a joy that emerges. If you can do that, then there's a use. And she herself found ways of doing that. How? Basically two. One, she discovered how to take the behavior changes one step at a time skillfully so that she could make adjustments and gain in self-confidence. She then knew the desperation that comes up isn't just suffering. This desperation that's coming up is the liberation of my love for the world. And I like love. Love feels great. It can feel hard too. We all know what it's like to love someone. Then they get hurt. We suffer along with them. We say, well, I don't want to love anyone anymore. Or they change. We can't control them. We love them, but we can't control them. That seems terrible, doesn't it? It's awful. If I, I could, I'd be happy if I could love you and just make you into who I want you to be. But unfortunately, I love you and I can't make you into who I want you to be. And so I'm suffering. And yet we see in that place that that love is better than a lack of it. And she could feel that, that love for the world emerging, emerging, growing, filling her, allowing her to dive deeper into the pain of the world, which is natural when you love the world, to experience the pain, the terror of the possibility that one ignorant, selfish species has so much control and so much ignorance. So in throwing herself into that, there was an excitement, an amazement, an awareness that there's an inherent value in this. And so the desperation grew, deepened. And as she walked through the night, she found no answers, no answers, no answers. And it's so common that people come and train in a monastery and get to the point when they can't find answers anymore. I don't even know I'm here anymore, they say. I'm not getting joy out of anything, they say. I don't understand who I am. What am I doing here? Maybe I should leave. Not understanding that however long it took you to get to that point, that was time well spent. That was her goal to get to that point. Really to a point of losing all of the things that we've used as as crutches, as tethers, so that our mind will feel safe. To become released from that means entering a territory we've never seen before. And that's what happened to her that night. She got no answers. 
And she, as those of you who are familiar with her work know, primarily couched, embedded, uh, structured her teachings within the Christian uh, <coughs> tradition, conceptual framework. Uh, now, Christianity is a mixture of many different traditions. There's a Jewish influence, of course. There's a Greek, Greco-Roman influence. Of course, those of you who don't know about this can research this. And there is possibly, most importantly, a Zoroastrian influence. Uh, Zoroastrianism, base, it's, of course, it's an entire tradition. It's hard to explain. But to put it in just a few sentences, is a fundamentally dualistic tradition in which it's said that there's good and there's evil, and they fight with each other, and you should be on the good side. Okay? That may seem to us like, well, yeah, everybody says that. But actually, to my knowledge, that concept, that worldview was only invented one time in world history and then spread very quickly. It turned out to be a very effective, uh, what? <laughs> well, yeah, it helps a lot with politics, of course, is one of the reasons it spreads. Um, but it turned out to be a very effective uh, pedagogy. So uh, she puts a lot of her teachings in terms of that. Uh, good versus evil, truth versus falsehood. Um, uh, and then, of course, love and hate, I actually think, are a little bit different. Uh, so... <clears throat> So she, uh, that night, being in something, just there we are. She was something of a Christian-ish mindset, uh, uh, theistic, you could say, mindset. She was asking God. She said, God, what, what, what would I do? I don't know what to do with my life. I don't know how to do this. No answers. And finally, but each next time she didn't get an answer. Not, she didn't do what so many of us do, which is pull back and say, okay, jerk. If you're not, you don't answer my questions, I'm going to go back to my YouTube watching. No, she became more intent, more willing to listen. The less she heard, the more she knew I have to listen. It wasn't, I'm not, you're not speaking loud enough, God. Speak louder or I'm leaving. No. Listen more. If I can't hear you, I need to listen. Let me listen. And as she listened more and more deeply, she experienced the first fundamental shift in her life, which she said is a point of no return. And as she puts it, she experienced the complete willingness without reservation. And those two words are the, are the most important part of the sentence. Without reservation. She puts it in italics. She emphasizes it. She repeats it. A complete willingness without reservation to give her life to God. Whatever it is. That, I, that you need me to experience, I'll take it. I, I won't prevent that. I won't resist. What is that I need to do? Completely relinquish self-will. I give my life up. This was in the early morning. She'd been walking all night. And she felt suddenly an energy, a peace that was unlike anything she'd experienced before, unlike anything she dreamed of, unlike anything she expected, unlike anything she could have ever wanted. And then it was gone. Just a little while later, just passed away. And I think 
uh, will talk more as time goes on about her life. But the most important thing I'd like to emphasize now uh, in this relatively short introduction is that from that moment, which is a point of no return, to the moment when she experienced the next point of no return, was 15 years of hard work. 15 years. She was in her 30s when that first experience arose. 15 years. Probably, it's hard to know, her, her timeline isn't very clear, but say in her early 50s. And uh, we'll talk more about this 15 years, I hope even though it's the part that people don't want to hear about. It's hard to bring people to a Sunday evening sit if you're going to talk about drudgery. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to try. Because drudgery is where this happens. The rest is just an advertising campaign. Drudgery is what part that I wanted to know about. <laughs> yeah, drudgery is what matters. And I hope we have time for this at some point. Remind me. Uh, but we're running a bit out of time now. So 15 years later, uh, unless that clock is wrong again, I'll check the time I have. Yes, the clock is correct today. So uh, <clears throat> 15 years later, working hard, uh, lost that experience, no idea where it went, striving to find it. Finally, it happened again. And then it was gone again. And then it came back again. And then it was gone again. She'd come into harmony with, as she put it, God's will, which she did by, as she put it, following God's laws. And then she'd be out of harmony again. She wouldn't be sure why or how to get back in harmony, what had happened. But she started noticing that her life seemed, her, her perception of what a life has changed to the sense that our lives are teaching tools and our experiences are, are structured in order to push us into harmony. Anytime that we act out of harmony, we suffer. And so that's good. Good news, you suffer. Be, and that's great. You experience that directly. And that's an encouragement, very kind encouragement to bring us back into harmony. And she started noticing how this works. And we can hear the sentence, and that's great. But to know how this actually works directly, this is wisdom. And she gave rise to that wisdom and learned, ah, yes. But then it would go away, be gone, and she'd be out of the deep peace. And then search again and it would come again and then be gone again and then come again and be gone again but gradually it lasted longer and longer periods of time and then once again she was there out in nature talking to god 15 years later 15 years of mistakes struggle failure confusion And she just asked another simple question. She said, God, it seems to me that when I'm in harmony, Jennifer, would you mind moving this way just a bit? Thanks, no problem. Uh, it seems to me that when I'm in harmony, I'm more useful. So why am I not always in harmony? Such a simple question. God, it seems that when I'm in harmony, I'm more useful. So why am I not always in harmony? Why? Okay. 
No answer. Nothing. Silence. Nothing. Silence. Nothing. So she asked again. No answer. Silence. So she asked again. And then late in the evening, she just gave up, went to bed. And when she woke up the next morning, she was back in harmony. And she knew, the first thing she knew upon waking was, it's over. I don't need to fall out of harmony ever again. There's no reason ever again. There's nothing more for me to learn there. I'm finished. It's over. And in fact, that's what happened. Forward. She experienced inner peace for the remainder of her life. She never experienced sadness for a moment. She never experienced anger for a moment. She never experienced fear for a moment. She never experienced loneliness for a moment. She never experienced exhaustion for a moment. And never for one moment was she unclear regarding God's laws. And one of the reasons that I want to talk about Peace Pilgrim is that there's a bit of a fad right now, especially in the American Buddhist movement, especially among the hyper-intellectual white men. And they say, such an experience, such a person, does not exist. People like that don't really exist. It's a myth. They say that to trick you, to trap you in their traditions. But it's not real. Enlightened people aren't real. Therefore, I'm enlightened. Really, this is real. I'm not making this up. There are a lot of people doing this right now. People who really have transcended fear, anger, sadness, loneliness, don't exist. Therefore, I, who still experience those things regularly, am at the pinnacle of spiritual development. Ta-da. And I have a book here also. In which I claim to be fully enlightened. Because anything above my level isn't real. It's a myth. But it's been said since ancient times that if we achieve full awakening, then that day we will find our calling. And we'll leave the trap of society, of what we call the world, of what we call the real world. <laughs> we'll leave that constructed fabrication and enter a completely new life. And that day, she had the vision. She saw a map of the United States. And right there on the map was the route that she would take as she walked across the country. 
speaking on behalf of peace. And she saw her clothing, special clothing. You could say a monk's clothing, a nun's clothing, a tunic, pants, shirt, with Peace Pilgrim written on it. And she knew her message. Took a little bit of work, of course, to get it just right, which is okay. But she knew the basic message, which ended up being, I will walk until given shelter. And I will fast until given food. And I will continue to live this way until humankind has learned the way of peace. And the way of peace is this. Overcome. Hatred. With love. Overcome falsehood with truth. Overcome evil with good. she lived that message every moment for the rest of her life. In finding that calling, as some of you read, she gave up. A goal, a question that she'd had for a long time. And the question was, can I find a spiritual community based on love, integrated into this culture, so that people living together, practicing a spiritual path in centers throughout our civilization can cultivate and preserve the best in the human race. She didn't find that and she gave up on that goal. fulfilling it. We're fulfilling it now. We're achieving that. We've done it. It exists. I hope that it can serve as a bit of a thank you, a little bit of a thank you for the sacrifices 
that she made. The sacrifice of her life. Posture that's straight, upright, connecting heaven and earth. With your spine grounded in the earth and your spine extending up into heaven. And relax into that posture. And begin to search for the silence. The silence listen to the silence. If you can hear the silence, listen to it. If you can't hear the silence, then that's wonderful. This is your chance to listen even more closely. There's no need to make it about me. Can I hear the silence? Yes, I can. No, I can't. It's not about that. It's about trusting that as we seek the silence, the experience that arises is trustworthy. And we receive it fully, willing to experience this. And continuing to search, not pushing, not straining, but listening.
Feel free if you'd like to shift your position. Once again, reestablish your posture. Continue with the exercise. Listen to the silence. If you hear silence, listen to it. If you don't hear silence, and that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you, and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with God, and it doesn't mean that there's something wrong with reality. It means that this moment is an opportunity to learn how to listen. So we simply make use of that opportunity and listen a little bit more closely, maybe more closely than we've ever listened before. And we enter a territory we've never experienced before. And that's okay. In fact, it's fun. And if you'd like to encourage this process in a slightly different way, And ask. Ask the question, where is silence? If an answer comes, then that's fine. But we know that that's hypocrisy. Any answer that comes is not silence. So examine that answer and set it aside and ask again, where is silence? Practice this. Every answer that comes is not the answer to the question. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with you or with the universe or with this practice. just that we're 
being given the opportunity to listen in a completely different way to an answer that comes in a completely different way that we can't imagine or dream about or expect or force or manipulate or fabricate or possess or resist. We simply ask, where is silence? And then listen for the answer. If no answer comes, listen to that. And if an answer comes, investigate it and set it aside. There are many different experiences that come with this exercise. You can ask, where is silence? And we hear the leaves blowing in the wind. And we know, ah, yes, very good. The leaves blowing in the wind. <clears throat> it's beautiful. Thank you for that wonderful answer. But we know it isn't the answer to this question. And so we set it aside. And ask, where is silence? And here, a voice within tell us, you'll find the silence within. And we say, thank you. That's a wonderful answer. I appreciate it. We examine it. But we acknowledge that that answer also isn't silence. And so we set it aside. We receive whatever answer we receive, and then we let it go with appreciation and ask again.
we may ask and see an image in our minds of where silence is. No words, just an image. We can be grateful. Thank you, image, for your contribution to this practice. But we know that images are not silence. And so we set it aside and ask again, where is silence? Maybe we hear in our minds some meditation instruction. Or maybe we'll hear in the room somebody giving meditation instruction. And we can be grateful. Thank you, sorry. Thank you for your instruction. I appreciate it. But it's not silence. And so we set it aside.
go. This is a time for questions, uh, discussion, comments, anything you'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you know when you found silence? That's a good question. You should ask that question. <laughs> That's right. Good job. Is anyone looking at Logan's face? You should. He looks how you should feel. How do you feel with that answer? Um, you can be honest, it's fine. We're friends. We know each other. We've had a meal together. Maybe a little confused. Mm. Well said. That was phrased very skillfully. <laughs> mm -hmm. Any little confused? Anything else? Just confused? Hmm, good. Contemplative. Good. Anything else? No. Okay. You feel satisfied with the answer? Pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> You're shaking your head, yes? Uh, hmm, yeah. Yes. Good. <laughs> You can see, right, that this is what she was experiencing. She asked the question, and I'll answer. And then she probably had a look on her face, just like your face has right now. And so she asked again. And then she asked again. And then she asked again. Each next time, trying to listen a little bit more carefully. Anything else on that? No, it's all good. And so often we uh, feel a little frustrated. What kind of an answer is that? You feel confused. Uh, <clears throat> but as you say, that's an aid to the experience of contemplation. We often believe that it's a hindrance. Right? I could be contemplative if I just wasn't confused. But I'm confused, and so it's not working. That's really what people think, really. And that's why we look like you looked. You're not the only one, trust me. Am I right? No. Has anyone else ever felt confused, annoyed that they were confused, and wishing someone would just tell them the answer for once? No one else has felt this way. Sorry, Logan, apparently not. Oh, okay. Very good. I have felt this way. Uh, and the question is, how do we receive that? As I already said, a lot of people will uh, train in a monastery and years pass and then finally they're experiencing a sense that nothing's really that satisfying and nothing really makes sense. And I don't even know why I'm here anymore and who am I and why am I not happier? I don't even know what the question is actually. 
think I should leave. Really, people say that. <laughs> I won't ask them to raise their hands. <laughs> but some are in this room right now. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, okay. One only. I'll ask only one person to raise his hand. Okay. I have had that experience. <laughs> None of the rest of you have to raise your hand. Uh, <clears throat> and the question is, how do we receive that experience? Of course, we can say, because I'm confused and uncomfortable, there's something wrong. So my external circumstances should change so that I don't feel confused and uncomfortable anymore. External circumstances means someone else should tell me the answer. You understand what I'm saying? That's external. You see how I'm external? You ask me, I tell you. Someone else should tell me. Some, and if they don't, there's something wrong with the world. And yet we can also receive that as an encouragement to listen more closely. Because I've heard through the grapevine that you're actually quite good at listening. I have. People have told me that. Hmm. So take advantage of that skill. Make use of it. Anything else? Um, what is the way to approach these illnesses that society is not like depression and anxiety? Oh, yes. Uh, so I think there are a few things to say about that. The question was, if I'm not mistaken, how do we approach these illnesses that society has brought? Depression and anxiety and such. Is that correct? So I think in your question, you're saying that society causes those illnesses. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. That's what you meant by society has brought. I mean, society has given us. Society. Uh, our society functions in such a way that we end up feeling depressed and anxious. Is that correct? All right. Good. So then I'd like to say two things about that. One is that that's true. To a certain extent, society gives us those illnesses. And one of the phenomena that interests me most, even though it's very hard to track, there are very few case studies of this that you can actually do. But if you hear of any, of any please let me know. It is in certain cases you can track the modern uh, civilization, the modern society, the modern worldview, uh, as it enters another and takes over. Does that make sense? So there, there might be a, a country or a part of a country somewhere in the world where the, the mindset that we grew up in here, probably everyone here, certainly most of us here, I grew up in, uh, I have a friend, a good friend, who grew up in the, in the jungles of Burma. In the jungle. She grew up with a completely different set of a completely different view on life, a completely different uh, sense of who she is, of what she is, than I grew up with. Different in ways that are amazing. Uh, and yet, we see that Burma gradually is shifting to the more modern worldview. Yes? 
we're currently in a, in a stage in history of homogenization. Of homogenization, where cultures are being homogenized through, to a large extent, to a certain extent, of course, mixing, but also to a certain extent, a certain civilization is taking over. Uh, not so much civilization. What's the word I'm looking for? Mindset. Yeah, mindset, maybe. Culture, maybe. Something like that. Maybe you all know what I'm referring to. Um, what? Capitalism. Yeah, that's a symptom. That's a consequence of it. That's an aspect of it. It's bigger than that, but that is a very important part of it. Capitalism. Um, a certain way of looking at things, a certain way of relating to each other, a certain way of perceiving the world, uh, understanding what's real and what isn't. Um, and as you see that happen, uh, you can watch, you can observe in, in certain cases, and if you know more cases, let me know, but in certain cases, you can actually watch mental illnesses that are, that we in our civilization think are just part of life, like eating disorders. Probably people just have eating disorders, right? There's certain people, some people have them. Like anything else, right? You know what I mean? Some people have darker hair than other people. Some people have eating disorders, other people don't. That's just how it is. But actually, in many cultures, eating disorders are completely unknown. Centuries pass with no one having an eating disorder. <laughs> and then our civilization or world set, mindset or culture or whatever we're calling this arrives. And you can see them, you can see the eating disorders just arise with it. It's amazing. And you can, you can watch a wave spread from the coast, which is usually where it begins, inland. Now, there are very few cases where you can actually study this, uh, but there are a few. So to a certain extent, there's no question that, not that the modern culture is, is worse than every other in, in every way. Of course not. But uh, it's not that things just get worse, you know? And it's not that things just get better. And it's dangerous if we start taking those extreme views. But some things get worse and some things get better, right? And so in certain ways, our society does give us certain kinds of depression, anxiety, and such. Uh, and that's one question. You tell me if I'm wrong. That there's actually another question that's a different question. And the other question is, what about the depression and anxiety that doesn't come from outside, but which is somehow bound up in, in something deeper than culture? Is that also part of this question or not? Okay, great. Very good. And let's set that question aside. No, I Sorry, guys. <laughs> it's her question. So we're going to set that question aside and just stay with the culture one. Okay? Very good. So the question of culture, how do you deal with the influences from outside, right? How do you deal with that, these influences that cause us suffering, depression, anxiety? And it's an excellent question, so thank you for asking, and thank you for being honest about the exact content of the question. Uh, <clears throat> Earlier I discussed a phenomenon in which we, we intentionally cultivate an awareness of the specific cases in which we, through our own power, are able to change our behavior, either in our thinking, our relationships, or our actions, the things we do. Does that make sense? We can do that. And we can, in, I'm going to say it again, we can intentionally pay attention to the specific cases in which we, through our own power, are able to make those changes. And little things matter here. Subtle is significant, as we say. Little things really matter. 
And one of the ways that the society, I believe, this is just a theory, I could be wrong about this one uh, dramatically. I might change my mind tomorrow. But my impression today is that one of the ways that our society imprisons us is by telling us, if you don't do big things, then you're not doing anything. You better do big things. Little things don't matter. Yes, it's a big world. You need to change the world. If you don't, well, then it doesn't matter. A very skillful way to get someone to do nothing is to tell them to do everything. Yes? And so uh, a lot of people I know have so much desire to do good, and the very next emotion that arises is shame. Well, shame is going to shut you down. And I believe that there's a subtle brainwashing in this to get us to experience that. So the people who most want to improve things are the least likely to do it. Because they're the most likely to feel that sense of, well, if I can't do everything, then I'm not doing anything. So it's essential for us to carefully attend to the specific cases, even if they're small, and actually especially if they're small, in which we are able, through our own power, own determination, to make a change. Yes? This is what you call the cultivation of positive self-will. And yes, ultimately, as Peace Program says, our hope is for self-will to be completely relinquished and, and God's will, as she called it, to take over. And as she said, once God's will takes over, you have found inner peace. It's that simple. It's not more complicated. Don't let it get more complicated. But that's not a feasible step. <laughs> okay? You can't say, okay, try it. And if it works for you, then great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it doesn't. And so, and so instead of that, we have feasible steps in which we, we go from uh, problematic self-will to, or infected maybe, self-will to purified self-will. And that's done through observing the specific cases in which through our own choice, we can make a change. What's a good example of this? Well, how about this one? We tend to have negative thoughts about ourselves or others. And so occasionally it turns out that we can stop paying attention to that and feel our breathing. That's a huge step. Don't let anyone tell you it's not. Why is it so huge? Because it's so small. Because it's a feasible step. In this world, the difference between big and small stops functioning, stops working, doesn't apply. And so you take that small step, bring your attention to your breaths. Now, sometimes the thought really grabs your attention, but sometimes you can bring it back. Attend to that. Confirm that that's the case, that you have that ability. And with that, a certain kind of confidence emerges. And I say a certain kind on purpose. It's a, it's a certain kind that we have to taste. We have to get to know that flavor of self-confidence. It's different from many other forms. It has a specific flavor. How do we discover it? Simple, by discovering it. That's how. Not by thinking it through and trying to remember what that person said it should be, but by ourselves, through a direct experience, observing how we ourselves, through our own self-will, can make a change. Yes? We, the more we attend to those changes, the more confidence we have, the more confidence we have, the more joy and the more ease we'll find in making those changes. And as that confidence, ease, joy arises within us, we have an alternative, an alternative source of happiness to the happiness provided by our society. Because people need happiness. You have to have happiness. You're going to seek happiness. And if you don't find the happiness that comes from this kind of cultivation, well, then you're going to find the happiness that comes from, you know, sugar and YouTube. Right? This is how it is. It's, it's not bad. It's actually a good choice. People aren't wrong. We need happiness. If you don't have this kind, you're gonna have, you're gonna find another kind. You're not mistaken. You're doing the reasonable thing. 
that what makes sense though is to turn our attention to this until we start to ask, what I can do this? Whoa. Really? I, I just did it again. And then something arises that can feed us so that we don't need to be fed by this these structures, these external structures. And once we've achieved independence from them in terms of our happiness, the pavement cracked. <laughs> it's it's crumbling now. You're, you're, it's going to happen now. You're going to keep going. You like it. No longer do you have to say, eat your vegetables. You know? You like the vegetables now. You're going to want to eat them. Right? It's not like going up to a little kid and saying, eat your vegetables or else. I'm going to be mad or whatever you say. It turns out, oh, the kid likes vegetables. <laughs> Great. Just put them in front of him. They're gone. <laughs> it's like that then. Because you're liking this. And so it feeds you. Society can hold us in its grip because it's the only source of pleasure that most of us know. The sensual pleasures based on capitalism are the only kind of happiness that most of us can consistently find. So naturally we're enslaved. Of course we're enslaved. It's, that's the only source. We're, we, I mean, it makes perfect sense. It's not that there's something wrong with us. It's just, that's all we know. But when we find this other kind of pleasure, it comes from that sense of confidence, transformation, adventure, fun, then that starts to replace the craving. It is in a certain way, you could say, still craving. And we have to let go of that in the end. But a feasible step is we're trying to, we're trying to, I, I like the phrase, we're trading up our cravings. We're trying to get better and better kinds of greed. <laughs> yes? Better and better kinds of self-centered desire. And this is just a better kind. So we trade up and we let go of the need to have these external sources of, of happiness, whatever they may be. We have an internal source, it's an alternative, it's a replacement, and it feeds us so that we grow more healthy. And then we can do it even more. Does that answer your question? About five more minutes. If there's anything else. Yeah. Is there a relationship between the silence and God's will? That's a good question. What do you think? I do think there is a relationship. Hmm, so do I. Does that answer the question? It does. I, I suppose I didn't articulate it as well as I could have, but it answers the question. What's the relationship? That's a better question. No, well, what is it? You seem to think there is one. What do you think it is? That's a very difficult question for me to answer in that I don't really know what either one of them is. Mm -hmm. There's the relationship. <laughs> Hopefully not for the rest of you. <laughs> yeah, I think there maybe we differ. Because I would hope that it is that way for all of us. Well, I'm just I'm speaking of my ignorance. As I'm speaking of our ignorance. Okay. I hope that we're all ignorant in that yeah. way. 
because those uh, those are two things that aren't subject to human understanding. So if we know what they are, we've lost them. Or perhaps we stop seeking them. Uh, if you know what they are, have you stopped seeking them? Yes, I'd say so. Which would be, from a certain perspective, tragic. From a certain perspective. You could also say that not seeking them is finding them. You could put it that way also. That would be a different way of understanding the same phrasing. Good. Well, we still have about five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What about the anxiety and depression that doesn't come from culture? Mm. Yes, this is a very deep question because there's no way to escape from it. Right? Mm -hmm. Everywhere you go, there you are. Mm -hmm. it sounded like a good sentence at first, but then you had the question if that was such a good thing after all. <laughs> so, <laughs> I thought that was good. Mm. <laughs> I can't tell my favorite story about this. We don't have time. Ask around. Some people here know it. The one going up on the hill. Funny story. So, uh, oh, yeah. I mean, even though they didn't have our society and culture. Of course, that's exactly right. Okay, that's exactly right. There's a there's a fundamental suffering, which uh, we eventually have the courage to face, is unavoidable. We don't know how to escape from it. Everywhere we look leads into it, not away from it. We cannot escape. It's everywhere. We experience it when we're st sitting, standing, moving around, lying down. We're always uncomfortable. We have that direct experience. And a lot of us think that that's a problem if we have that. It's terrible, I'm having this experience. But actually, uh, we're facing that experience. If we create that experience, then that's only bad. There's no virtue in creating suffering whatsoever. The Buddha recommended very clearly, I don't recommend that you suffer for even one moment. Yes? But if we face it, that's, that's very different from creating it. To face something that is present is not the same as creating something that's not present. And this point has to be made very clear because a lot of the time subconsciously we're not clear on this. And I've heard people say, I've been having a really hard time recently, so my practice is must be really, must be, it's, a, it's been a great opportunity for training. People might say something like that. Sometimes they just say, so things are going well in my practice. Mm -hmm. but, but, but even if they don't say that, which is, another level of delusion. They just say, it's a great opportunity for training. Well, suffering is not necessarily a great opportunity for training. It could be, but happiness could be a great opportunity for training. They're both an opportunity or not, depending on how we relate to them, not depending on, on su the suffering. We can train with suffering or without suffering. That's our own relationship with our experience. So it's very important that we not get confused and think, oh, good, I'm suffering things are going well. That's not the case. But it's also not the case that now I'm facing suffering that I haven't been able to face before, so things are going badly. Yes? Mm -hmm. So we face it, and we see that, there, that there's an underlying, some underlying pattern, some underlying source, some deep underlying uh, uh, way of uh, way <laughs> underlying way underlying something that keeps on producing suffering and we seek that in order to cut it 
Mm. And lots of people can tell us what it is. It's craving, it's attachment to self. It's uh, serving self-will. We People can say those words and it's good. It's useful for people to say those words, of course. We can feel grateful to them for saying those words, but ultimately we have to do that exploration for ourselves. As Harada Roshi said so brilliantly, teacher I trained with in Japan, he said, you yourself must discover wisdom. Why? Because you yourself are obstructing it. That's why. We are obstructing it. Therefore, we have to stop obstructing it. In fact, you say that we are obstructing it. We are the obstruction. <laughs> we are obstructing it. Obstructing it is what we are. <laughs> yes? And that's what Peace Pilgrim saw, that the sense of self-will isn't working. So that's got to go. But then how? And that's the drudgery, which is where all this really happens. Not a problem. It's a celebration, even though it's drudgery. So is that, is that useful? Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you for your answer. That was wonderful. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. P Peace Pilgrim culture. The Buddha was in an even more different culture from ours. Fool's Crow or some other spiritual leader from a totally different culture from ours. And yet everyone dealing with the same issue and discovering incredibly similar solutions. Very good. Now. Dessert, <laughs> sugar, let's, let's have some, yes? It's not bad, it's okay. No problem, not a big deal. So, how are we gonna make the world a better place this week? How are we gonna do it? I'm hoping we have a lot. Don't start fighting, who's gonna talk first? <laughs> oh yes! Um, so, on July 4th, mm -hmm. there is a, there's a thing called the Rainbow Gathering in the woods south from here, and um, they pray for peace on that day, international, interdimensional peace. And I think that even if it's something that you can't go to, I think it's important that you bring that into meditation practice and pray for interdimensional peace and independence. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, this day, three years ago, I um, went into the monastic academy, which was not called. Uh, um, and so this is my three years, and the only person left. Cheers. And that's definitely something we can do to help the world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well said. <laughs> uh, very good. <laughs> Anything else we can do to transform the world? Serve all living beings. Uh, hmm? Monday, September 1926, from 6 to 8 p.m., there's Mindfulness for Activists. Hmm at the Peace and Justice Center at 60 Lake Street in Burlington. Uh, so it's focusing on ways to cultivate mindfulness in activism, mm -hmm. how to you know, avoid burnout, uh, develop skills in meditation, 
uh, deep listening, you know, what Gandhi called soul force. So space is limited. Uh, there's a number to call. The number is, get ready, get your pen and paper, <laughs> screen viewers, 802-863-2345, extension 6. Uh, and any of you who want that, just ask me. <laughs> Good. And the peace and justice. Peace and justice. Center. And this is also a time, I'm aware that there are people here who are doing things for peace, doing things for the world. So this is a time that you can ask for help. Mm -hmm. If you like, you can share what you're doing and say, hey, if anyone wants to such and such, it would really help me out making the world a better place. So this is a chance for that. A lot of different options right now. Mm -hmm. uh, my friend Vicki Garrison is raising money to start a private practice. She would be the, either the first or the second African-American licensed clinician to have a practice in the state of Vermont. And so we're doing an online GoFundMe for her. So um, if you want more information about that, just let me know. Great. Thank you. Anything else? Mm -hmm. um, so at the monastery, we've just built the space to dry our clothes outside. So if anyone has extra clothes in their coat hangers uh, that you just have sitting around, that would be great. Uh, also, if anyone has a spare vacuum that you, that you just don't need anymore, no pressure. If you need it, you should have it. But um, uh, there's one more thing, but we'll put it in an email. I forgot what it was. Thank you. Good. And one thing that I asked, which I asked last week, is search for these activities, please. Search these out and share them with us. It's partially good to share them with us so that uh, we know what's happening. It's also good to establish this as a tradition in this community. Uh, and we have, we have that as a way to maintain this practice through the week and uh, connect the practice of awakening with the practice of responsibility, social, personal, environmental responsibility. Uh, so search out various activities like this and bring them next week. Very good. Thanks for being a part of this. And I look forward to continuing uh, the exploration of the work of Peace Pilgrim. This coming week will be in retreat. And usually I don't come here. But since it's just the second time in this series, I'm going to come anyway. So I will be here next week. And we'll be able to explore this a little bit more. And it's, who's making the announcement about the chanting? Yes, uh, if you'd like to join us for chanting on Mani Padme and have a little love and compassion in your evening, uh, we'll start at 7.15 and go to 